While the streets of San Andreas and Vice City must be hell for car owners and insurance companies alike, here in the real world, car thefts happen too. A lot, actually. Over 700,000 cars are stolen every year in the United States alone. In fact, if you listen to our episode about Bertha Benz, you know that people have been jacking cars for literally as long as cars have existed. This week we're talking all about Grand Theft Auto. Turns out it's not just a video game, it's also a serious crime. Luckily, as far as crimes go, car heists are a fun one to talk about. But don't worry, we're not going to go all true crime podcast on you. Uh, at least not at first. There will be no twisting investigations here, no tearful phone calls from prison, no ads for MailChimp. A disgruntled armored car driver steals a van filled with $19 million cash. A movie star's classic car collection goes missing just hours after his death. And two FBI agents accidentally destroy a rare supercar. What are the craziest, the dumbest, the most bizarre real-life car heists ever attempted? Who are the criminal masterminds, or morons, behind the real-life stories? Today on Past Gas, we have eight insane car heists. Gun it, baby! The fuzz are right behind us, man! Past Gas Podcast! It's about cars, it's not about ports! Big thanks to Valvoline for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. Do you guys know that Valvoline is the original motor oil? That's not just a talking point, that's true. They've had the patent for motor oil for over 150 years. Not only were they the first patented motor oil brand, they've also had many different firsts in the industry. Like the first high mileage oil, the first synthetic blend, and the first racing oil. That's a lot of firsts. And for over 150 years, they have not stopped innovating. They're constantly reinventing formulas to provide the ultimate protection for every single engine on the road today. Doesn't matter what it is, they got you covered. In fact, every motor oil that Valvoline makes has recently been reformulated to provide 40% better wear protection than industry standards. It's also proven to maximize engine life by fighting the four main causes of engine breakdown, which are heat, friction, wear, and deposits. I personally love Valvoline oil. I use it in my cars. It's just like a no-brainer. I always just go for Valvoline oil because they are the best. And another reason that we love Valvoline over here at Donut, they're synonymous with some of the greatest racing legends that have ever lived, like Mark Martin, Cale Yarborough, AJ Foyt, and the NASCAR Cup champion Chase Elliott. So, I mean, the proof is in the pudding. So do yourself a favor and make sure you choose Valvoline oil. Head over to valvoline.com slash original to find out the right oil for your engine. Thank you, Valvoline. Pull over. Skirt, skirt, skirt. I I ain't going back to prison. You are going back to prison. Pull over. (laughs) That's a Hemi. (laughs) Welcome back to Past Gas. That was a very, that was a good line, James. Good job. I want to give you props on that. Give you dabs. Thanks. I'm still working on my audition tape to get in Police Academy. <laughs> <laughs> I've been working on my my rotary engine sound. You want to hear it? Let's yeah. hear it. Let's hear it. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> James is not lying. He's definitely trying to get that reboot <laughs> part, which is no doubt on its way. Uh, welcome back to Past Gas, everyone. I'm your host, Nolan Sykes, joined as always by my other hosts, James the Mouth Pumphrey. <laughs> meow, meow. Nope, not a cat. It's just me, old James. <laughs> I thought that was a cat. You got, wow, you really got me. And uh, Joe Weber over there. What's up, Wink Wink Nation? Are we fired up yet? <laughs> I, um... I, I'm starting to take my TikTok a little bit more seriously, really jumping on the wagon early in the game on this one. Yeah, you really got in on the ground floor yeah, as far as really TikTok goes. On, yeah. Well, yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> and I got a new follower yesterday who commented on my post, and it was a, a past gas fan. I can't remember their name, but they were they said Wink Wink Nation, and I was like, all right, that's that's what it is. Wink Wink Nation. We're fired up. We got to... We gotta build up your your IP. What's your catchphrase for this, Nolan? I need a glass of water. <laughs> yes, <Yeah, so laughs> I'm Nolan Sykes, and I need a glass of water. I'm also joined by my. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Well, as the end, the intro uh, suggests, we are talking about stolen cars this week. We got a bunch of stories for you. Um, I have a question for you guys. Has your car, ha, has a vehicle of yours ever been stolen? Only by the city. Oh, no. Uh, I had a car, I had my 1990 Dodge Caravan stolen my, out of my family's alley when I was okay. probably like 17. We get and, it, Joe. Your family has an alley. <laughs> uh, we own that alley. No, but uh, the transmission was like really on the fritz, and it was doing the donkey donkey kick and slipping a bunch. So it was not pleasant to drive, and they found it two blocks away because the person <laughs> had just realized that it was super shitty. <clears throat> but the thing is, they had us go identify the... They caught the guy, too. They, he had a bunch of stuff that were was in my car. And I was like the sole driver at that time because my sister had gone to college. My younger sister was too young to drive. Uh, and I, the day before it had been stolen, a do rag was floating in the wind, and I caught it and and like wore it in the van, and then took it off. And so I had to go identify like two dollars worth of change and a do rag. <laughs> like I was like, "Are you sure this is yours?" <laughs> 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 uh, when I was a kid, my bike got stolen. I had left it outside, yeah, also in our alley. Uh, yeah, was, am I the only one who didn't have a family alley? <laughs> yeah. And uh, like <laughs> me and my family went out to dinner. I came back. The bike was gone. Oh, out to dinner. And I was like, oh, yeah, the, <laughs> at uh, Armando's Mexican restaurant. RIP, no longer around. Um, oh. But then this neighborhood kid... The, his name was Austin. He was kind of like a sketchy kid. He comes walking down the street with my bike. He's like, yeah, like, okay, this was like a family dinner. So like all my family was here, <laughs> like my parents, my grandparents. Uh, yeah. I think my aunt and uncle were also there. And uh, so this kid like is pushing my bike into my yard. He's like, yeah, like my mom found your bike in my laundry room. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Yeah, and she like wanted me to bring it back to you. And yeah, uh, do you have like a reward for me? <laughs> what were you doing in my mom's laundry room <laughs> with your bike, dude? That's that's messed up. That's that weird, sounds like dude. a Tim Robinson sketch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's like a some next door drama. Someone had gotten their rollerblades stolen off their porch, oh. and then someone found them after they bought rollerblades from someone on the street for $30. <laughs> like I was like, Hey, can you just give them back to me? And he was like, yeah, sure. Just like reimburse me for the 30 bucks. I paid this guy. Oh my God. It's $30. I know. And it's just, yeah, it was painfully obvious. This guy had taken them and is just, you know, pretending to be the guy who found them. But all this work for 30 bucks. It's the hottest new crime wave in Los Angeles. Blade napped. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of blade napped, let's get into the, our stories this this week. Give me back my K twos, you monster! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's start this episode as we start every morning by heading to Flavor Town. You probably know Guy Fieri as the host of Diners, Drive-ins, and Dives, or perhaps the owner of the worst reviewed restaurant. What? Uh, owner of one of the worst reviewed restaurants in history which I'm so surprised by, Guy's American Kitchen Bar, where the New York Times said, quote, the toasted marshmallow tastes like fish. I would have expected <laughs> more from Guy Fieri. I'm sorry. I respect that, man. But you might not know that the original Flavor Gangster also has an extensive car collection that includes a 68 Firebird and a 67 Camaro and is worth an estimated $8.5 million. Whoa. This man slings a lot of donkey sauce, all right? <laughs> and they're yeah. all yellow too, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I believe so. That's so funny. The crown jewel of Fieri's collection used to be a bright yellow 2008 Lamborghini Gallardo. Oh, Gallardo, excuse me, James. Worth 200000 bucks. But in 2011, while Fieri was filming in Chicago, his Lambo was stolen in spectacular fashion. A thief rappelled off of the roof of a San Francisco dealership where the car was undergoing repairs, snuck into the storage lot, cracked the car's window, disabled the alarm, and drove it off the lot. Despite the security footage of the entire theft, the police couldn't find the culprit for over a year. In between, <laughs> Guy's Lambo was caught on traffic cameras driving over the Golden Gate Bridge. 
<laughs> Several of Fieri's friends reported seeing it out and about elsewhere in the Bay Area. Here at Donut, we encourage people to drive their cars, even if they're worth a lot of money. But this wasn't this guy's car, so I kind of feel a little torn. It wasn't this guy's car. It was that guy's car. Ah! <laughs> Dude, I respect the hell out of this. I think that's <laughs> a thief. Cool. <laughs> like, yeah, he steals it, and then he's just like, I got a Lambo now. <laughs> like driving it, is they didn't like part it out or scrap it or yeah not just any lambo the most conspicuous lambo yeah. ever made uh, yeah <laughs> well not by a long shot but no <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah i just like i'm just like <laughs> i love that yeah he didn't scrap it he was just like i have i wanted lambo i got lambo now i drive lambo he manifested like, it, it by rappelling off of a building yeah and then like drives it around like the same city <laughs> hey man i saw your stolen lambo the other day i tried to like catch the guy but you know v10 <laughs> <laughs> well in may of 2012 the police finally arrested the thief they caught him for attempted murder in the immortal words of the beach blonde god himself holy moly stromboli that's a big charge uh the thief turned out to be 16 year old san rafael native max wade about a year after the Lamborghini had gone missing, Wade fired a gun multiple times into a truck carrying his ex-girlfriend and her new boyfriend. Oh, God. And then he sped off on his motorcycle. The couple luckily escaped unharmed and cops traced Wade back to a storage unit where they eventually arrested him. Sitting in the storage unit next to Wade's getaway bike, they discovered Guy Fieri's Lamborghini. This is the... A pretty cool, even though he fired a gun at his ex. Like, he did try to kill someone, and he's like 16, so like, you know, it was over some, it was over some dumb A 16-year-old. When I was 16, I was identifying do-rags. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Max, <laughs> the, 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 the attempted murderer, Max Wade, was sentenced to life in prison for Whoa. double premeditated attempted murder, plus... A separate 16 month sentence for stealing uh, Guy Fieri's flavor mobile. I, uh, Fieri. What year was this? Uh, this was in 2012. Fieri testified at Wade's trial, but never managed to get the car back. At the, oh, no. uh, once the trial ended, it was reportedly confiscated by Fieri's insurance company. And at the end of the day, Max Wade probably put more miles on the Lamborghini than its rightful owner. I don't know how I feel about yeah, I mean, he did, gonna, yeah, he did try to kill two people, but he, I mean, he didn't succeed though. Like, but it's like, did he try, you know, did he really want to, did he just, you know, like he's 16, obviously he's got some issues out here stealing cars and not getting rid of them, just driving them around. Okay. I feel like this is definitely like a, this guy could be reformed situation. I think so. I think there's time. Any, uh, so yeah, I'm looking at a, this is from the Mercury news up in the yeah. Bay area. I just I had to look into this. Um, uh, he was sentenced to 21 years to life to life in prison. Oh, okay. So he is eligible for parole in 2025. And uh, his sentence so, got cut too. Okay. Well, that okay. Okay. All right. Okay. 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 They just wanted to scare the poop out of him. I hope it worked. I hope it worked. Yeah. Get your head on straight, Max Wade. Max Wade sounds like a sounds like a Punisher type character. Max Wade. Max Wade. The next insanely real car heist is called the Sad Man's Revenge. Why is he sad? <laughs> well, I don't. I think you're about to find out. <gasps> Do you hate your job? Probably not as much as Philip Noel Johnson did. Phil was an armored car driver at Loomis Fargo Bank for 10 years, which meant hauling millions of dollars around Florida and Georgia, all while making a measly seven bucks an hour. First mistake, pay the people who protect your money. <laughs> yeah. Just a little yeah. bit more. Also pay the people who make your food. Pay, just everyone should get paid. Yeah. And some pay. people should get paid less, but most people should get paid more. Philip was, by all accounts, an unhappy guy who complained constantly. I know the type. Acquaintances said he was bitter about a lifetime of lost opportunities and especially obsessed over his crooked spine, which he blamed for keeping him out of the police or military service. Probably had scoliosis. But maybe it was all a cover. Maybe Philip was a master criminal the whole time. 
Because on March 29th, 1997, he planned and executed the largest cash heist of all time. Right. Okay. Means ever. <laughs> that means to date. Is that <laughs> does that mean like to the present time? Up until that point, Joe. Up until that point, my man. After finishing a shift, Johnson drove his armored car to the Loomis Fargo garage in Jacksonville, Florida. Side note, of course this happened in Jacksonville, Florida. Birthplace of Limb Biscuit. Uh, he pulled a gun on two fellow guards, handcuffed them, and stuffed $18.8 million from the vault into his van. Before leaving, he collected surveillance tapes, paperwork from the day's pickups, and his own personal file, then sabotaged the vault so it wouldn't open the next day. Hmm. Police and the FBI eventually discovered that Johnson had been planning the robbery for five years, a full half of the time he was complaining about his terrible job. They also couldn't find him. Loomis Fargo quickly posted a $500,000 reward. Then the Washington Post published a picture with the story headline, Have you seen this man? He's 33, single, lonely, grouchy, <laughs> rumpled, and very possibly the richest thief who ever lived. Imagine completing an incredible heist, then getting pwned hard by the Washington Post. Thanks, Soros. Yeah. <laughs> I also think it's like, just like, hey, we'll give you half a million dollars if you find our $18.8 million. Yeah. Like, I'm glad he stole it. If I find that, I'm going to keep the other part of it. I'm not going to turn that in. Yeah, if I found it, I'd be like, give me a million bucks. I won't tell. Yeah. Look, I'll tell people that you're not rumpled and you got a good back. <laughs> yeah, I'll be like, if so, if anybody asks, I'll be like, yo, he is not even lonely. <laughs> six months later johnson was finally caught when a customs inspector at the u.s mexico border pulled him off a bus because he gave suspicious answers about the reason for his trip investigators discovered all but 186,000 of his haul hidden in a north carolina storage shed oh man can you imagine that on like getting bidden on that storage i paid 600 bucks for this storage unit yeah 18.8 million dollars yeah yeah <laughs> That's what the guy does, right? Johnson also surrendered sixty five thousand dollars in eight Mexican bank accounts and eleven grand in cash. That means he only got to spend one hundred ten thousand dollars of his eighteen point eight million he stole before he was convicted and sentenced to twenty five years in prison. This probably did not help his outlook on life. The lesson here: if you steal millions of dollars, don't take a freaking bus and spend as much money as you can while you're still out of jail. Yeah, and don't go to North Carolina. There's much better places you can go and escape to. I'm sure North Carolina's great, but like uh, Tahiti? Buy a plane. Buy a plane and have someone <laughs> fly you. Just don't have Harrison Ford fly you away. Or James May, who also crashed the plane. I think the lesson is just don't, don't fly a plane. I'm never going in a Cessna, and I'm never going in a helicopter. I think those are good policies. Those are good policies. Yeah, I'm, but I am building one of those drones that you stand on top of. <laughs> <laughs> you get one of those. I'll get one of the like the one the water ones where it shoots yeah. water underneath you. Oh yeah, that and is. I'll get a one wheel and I'll just putt around. Uh, yeah. I played baseball on a one wheel and was like fielding <laughs> in the outfield on a one wheel and just like hit a gopher hole and ate <laughs> super hard. Well, you know That's what, awesome. Joe, serves you right. A big thanks to Sunday for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. I don't know about you guys, but my lawn is a mess. Like, I don't even know where to start with it. There's so many problems. There's, you know, we have too much sun. Our soil is dry. There's pests. There's all these things that are like preventing me from working on my lawn. But Sunday is here to help you see your lawn thrive. And it's super easy. Sunday is more than just lawn care product. It's a custom lawn care plan with a variety of ways to help you grow a beautiful lawn, control weeds, and remove move pests. They take out all the guesswork and unwanted chemicals so you can grow a beautiful lawn that's better for your people, pets, and the planet. What I like best about Sunday is that all I had to do is put in my address and it scanned my lawn, figured out how much product I needed, and then it gave me a custom plan based on what the soil composition and the climate in my neighborhood is. 
which is insane to think about. If it's your first time taking care of your lawn, this is the product for you. Sunday is amazing. They make it so easy. I just went to getsunday.com and put my home address in and they did all the work for me. And Sunday is made with ingredients that you can actually pronounce like seaweed, iron, and molasses. Even though I've historically had a hard time pronouncing molasses, I could feel better about that. And they deliver it right to your door, which is cool because you don't have to leave your house at all. All I had to do was attach the ready to use pouch to my garden hose and I was spraying away. My lawn already looks better. Let Sunday take the guesswork out of growing a greener, more beautiful lawn this spring. Visit GetSunday.com slash P-A-S-T to get $20 off your custom lawn plan at checkout. That's $20 dollars off your custom lawn plan at getsunday.com slash past. Thank you, Sunday. Guys, if you've been opting out of skincare, I totally get it. What happens is you fall asleep on your couch watching YouTube videos, and then all of a sudden you wake up and there's like a Chiefs game from like 1997 playing. You're like, how'd the algorithm get here? Point is, you don't take any care of your skin. I've been there. And that's why I love this week's sponsor, Curology. The truth is most of us actually care about our skin and we just don't know where to start. If you're looking for something simple that works without being complicated, then you have to get Curology. Curology makes skincare effortless, okay guys? They create a custom skincare formula for your skin goals. Have you, have you wondered why my skin looks so clear and bright and fresh? I actually use Curology and this is a great product. Curology has a cleanser and a moisturizer that are easy on your skin and super easy to use. Everything ships right to your door and your first 30 days are free. You just cover five bucks for shipping and handling and boom, it's right on your doorstep. Sign up for Curology in minutes by sharing your skin type and skin goals and a licensed provider can create a custom formula made for you. Like one personalized formula that's all you. I'm serious about this. Whether you're struggling with acne or dark spots or just want something simple and straightforward, Curology's got you covered. They've also got some other amazing products that you can add to your subscription like an acne body wash, some emergency spot patches. So you can do it up or keep it simple. The process took about 10 minutes to uh, go through just had to upload a couple pictures of my face and my blemishes uh, from a few different angles answer some questions about you know my oiliness I'm kind of an oily guy uh, you know basic health stuff and they'll send a custom package straight to your door super convenient it shows up at my door honestly man my face is looking better than it probably ever has if you're ready for healthier skin and a routine that makes sense, do what I did and give Curology a go. Go to Curology.com slash gas, get a free 30-day trial, just pay shipping and handling. That's C-U-R-O-L-O-G-Y.com slash gas to unlock your 30-day free trial. See Curology.com for all the details. Speaking of a, a collision... This next story is called Ram Raiders. Oh, nice. Good. Good segue. What are you, the segue master now? I Ram thought... Raiders. <laughs> in the early 1990s, a missing Lotus Carlton made front page news in England because of some thieves who immediately put it to good use. First, a little backstory. In 1990, GM Europe wanted a performance sedan to compete with the BMW M5 and the Mercedes 500E. There is just one big problem. They didn't have a performance group to make it. They primarily sold mid-market cars under the Vauxhall and Opel badges. Luckily, GM Global had recently acquired a majority stake in Lotus. So GM Europe asked Lotus to turn the relatively boring Vauxhall Carlton executive sedan into something with a little bit more giddy up. So what did Lotus do? Simple, they strapped on two turbochargers, cranked a horsepower up to infinity, and the resulting Lotus Carlton sedan was, in a word, awesome. It could outgun a Ferrari Testarossa. It went 0 to 60 in 5.2 seconds and topped out at 177. And it was only sold in one color the extremely British sounding Imperial Green. This thing is freaking sick, dude. Is I it think really I, dark green? Because it looks black. I think it's a really dark green. The Lotus version looks like some weird, like if a. Uh... The Mercedes 190E had a baby with a Supra. I was gonna say like a like like the front kind of gives me like Fox body Mustang vibes. Yeah, and then the wheels are like kind of Porsche ish. It's really interesting looking car, dude. This thing would mop up at Radwood. Lotus Carlton's immediately became a top target for car thieves, and on November 26, 1993. 
One particular vehicle was stolen from outside a home in Pershore, England, a small town about three hours from London. Over the following months, a gang of thieves used this car in a series of ram raids across central England. What's a ram raid, you boys might ask? I yeah, might. I was going to ask that. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Well, I'm going to tell you. These absolute geniuses would ram their $90,000 <laughs> stolen car through the front window of a liquor store God. or newsstand, grab, his butt, <laughs> grab <laughs> as much booze and cigarettes as they can fit in the trunk, then outrun the police response in their juicy Lotus engineered street rocket. <laughs> Amazing. Mad lads. Absolute mad lads. <laughs> you know, there's one guy who was like, oh, I'm going to... This is a newsstand, right? I'm going to grab some magazines. Yeah. Oopsies, <laughs> I'm in first. Boom. <laughs> I need to get some mints and a new copy of The Post. <laughs> <laughs> the thieves left the cops, or the rosers, as they're called over there, thoroughly dusted every turn, including one theft 30 yards from a police department. Whoa. That's because the local police force's uh, Fiat Pandas could only reach 90 miles per hour <laughs> Barely half of that of the turbocharged Lotus. An officer told newspapers, quote, We simply haven't been able to get near the thing, and it looks unlikely that we ever will. We <laughs> might as well just go home, take a little shower, eat a little tea, and go to bed. Eat Wake up and do it all over in the morning. <laughs> That's an honest life, and we don't even carry guns. Okay? All right, there's a little bit of a interpretation of that quote. Anyway... Whatever it was, Joe, he was right. The Lotus Thieves were never caught and ultimately got away with around 20,000 British pounds worth of liquor and cigarettes. The gang became so notorious, the British government considered banning the Lotus Carlton entirely. Though by that point, the car was out of production, so <laughs> no law ever came to fruition. I bet they took credit for that. They're oh, like, yeah. Yep, we did that. <laughs> and that means the infamous Ram Raider is still street legal. And would make one hell of a barn find. That's, That's hilarious, cool. dude. That's cool. <laughs> they just stole cigarettes and booze. Yeah, like I they think, just left cash in the in the till. Yeah, I guess. Don't spend it all in one place. I bet these guys were fourteen. <laughs> well, yeah, they're stealing booze and cigarettes. Like that's like, all right, we have a car. What what can we steal? Yeah, can we go to Ooh, a quick, bank. Quick, think. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, let's get some Marlboro Reds. All right, guys, enough noodling, all right? Yeah. Let's get on with this. Enough noodling, guys. It's time to talk about the great ramen heist. <laughs> now we move from ram raids to ramen raids. Ah. At some point between July 25th and August 1st, 2018, thieves stole a 2004 Stoughton tractor trailer from a gas station in Fayetteville, Georgia, where the owner had left it parked for several days. This isn't that notable on its own. It's the kind of thing that happens to big shipping companies all the time. An unremarkable insurance write-off. Okay. Except that this particular trailer was filled with $98,000 worth of ramen noodles. Oh, okay. That's... Now now it's turned. Now there's a twist. Now I see where the, <laughs> the, the, the title of this section came from. That's so much ramen. How are you going to unload all those noodles? Dude, that could... That could last a, 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 a car guy, a dedicated car guy who only cares about his car. You that's only like eat a, ramen. That's a lifetime. That's a, yeah, he's he's got he's the only person in 2021 to have scurvy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my friend Trevor Moore in the whitest kids, you know, uh, he in college would would only eat. He would eat ramen with uh, Slim Jim's broken up oh into, god and he got a freaking <laughs> sore on his leg and he went to the doctor and he was <laughs> what? Like, the doctor was like what like you like you have sodium poisoning oh my god oh yeah. my goodness trevor yeah so that tro that cheap microwave dorm room ramen ninety eight thousand dollars worth of it those things wow. what are they like 50 cent 25 cents a pack yeah that's a lot of ramen Police never identified what ramen brand was heisted, but a ramen pack typically retails for about 30 cents and wholesales for even less. That means these hungry thieves got away with somewhere between 300,000 and 500,000 bricks of ramen. This could last the gears and gasoline crew for centuries. <laughs> <laughs> it's enough to wrap noodles around the world seven times. Whoa. 
or to stack into a pile taller than Mount Everest. In other words, a lunch. Yeah, you're going to be hungry half an hour later. <laughs> <laughs> Not if you throw celery and eggs and, and, and cilantro in there. That's there, good. That was like a... I think that's part of growing up is uh, discovering that you're not just supposed to have like the top ramen just really by itself. You like to really get the full experience. You should add a lot of accoutrement to it. Yeah. Yeah. Did they know it was a ramen truck? Like, were they hoping to steal iPads, but discovered quote unquote food instead? Or was this their Ocean's Eleven style dream job? Did they plan to steal a jillion noodles, then retire to a beach somewhere? And how do you launder stolen noodles? Is there a thriving ramen black market where you can buy it for 25 cents instead of 30 cents? <laughs> Alas, these questions will forever go unanswered. The crime was never solved, and the ramen raiders, just like the Ram Raiders, are still at large. I, I remember reading a news story within the last two years, someone had like stolen like a, a, a semi full of like meat, and they were like yeah. selling the meat out of like a parking lot out in like commerce or something like that. <laughs> so I think you could, if you did steal a whole semi full of noodles, like it would take you forever to get like any money out of it, I think, but you could do it, you know, black yeah. market noodles. You, you give some, you know, someone would buy a crate of it for oh, yeah. 20 bucks or something. Yeah. Like you're coming out of Best Buy with like a USB cable or whatever. And some guy approaches you like, Hey man, you want like some top ramen? And I'm like, how much top ramen? I just want to plug in my phone. <laughs> <laughs> but if someone was like, hey, I'll give you a box. Like, I'm selling boxes of Top Ramen for, like, a dollar. I'd probably be on that. Yeah, I think, like, if I were younger, I would. Now I'd be like, no, man, I don't get out of here, dude. <laughs> and then the cops yeah. pull you over. It's a sting <laughs> operation. You're, you're yeah. booked for stolen, <laughs> possessing stolen goods. That ramen is hot. <laughs> this is my hot ramen. <laughs> <laughs> and I ain't talking sriracha, baby. Speaking of which, it's time for the San Diego Tank Spree, which is one of my favorite historical events ever. Yeah. I think they're making a movie out of this. They better fucking not. I want to. I want to cast James as, as J or Sean, the guy who stole the, the tank. I'm so mad at society. I'm going to get a tank. Our, our next thief definitely knew what he was getting into. And that made him a huge problem when he took his bounty onto the streets of San Diego. On May 17th of 1995, an army veteran turned out of work plumber named Sean Nelson drove uh, to the California Army National Guard Armory. The past few years of Nelson's life had been pretty awful, to say the least. He had lost his parents to cancer. His wife had left him. He suffered serious injuries in a motorcycle accident. The bank foreclosed on his house and his living girlfriend died from a drug overdose. Amid these troubles, he had sunken into alcoholism and a meth addiction, which culminated into digging a 17-foot deep hole in his backyard to, quote, mine for gold. So clearly, Nelson was not in his right mind when he arrived at the armory, where he found the gate to the vehicle yard had been left standing wide open by some late-shift servicemen. He took this opportunity to trade up his Chevy Astrovan to a 57-ton yeah. patent tank that he just so happened to know how to operate from his stint in the army. I mean, a Chevy Astro van is basically a tank. <laughs> <laughs> the $1.3 million tank was 22 feet long and covered in 11 inch thick armor. It had a 750 horsepower Continental V12 twin turbocharged diesel engine and could get up to 30 miles per hour and started with a push button. No ignition key was required. Lucky for San Diegans, the ammunition for the tank's 105 millimeter cannon, 13 millimeter anti-aircraft gun, and 8 millimeter mounted machine gun was all kept in a separate location. So effectively, Nelson didn't have any weaponry, but a tank is still a tank. And this one did some serious damage. By the time a guard finally noticed him and sounded an alarm, Nelson was already out into the streets of San Diego's Claremont neighborhood. He led military police, the sheriff's department, and the highway patrol on a 23-minute televised slow-motion chase. The cops could easily keep up with the tank, but they had absolutely no way of stopping it. Nelson left behind a trail of 40 crushed cars, several geysering fire hydrants, and even a flattened RV. 
After trying and failing to knock down a concrete pedestrian bridge over Interstate 805, Nelson attempted to cross the other side of the freeway, but it got stuck on those concrete jersey barriers. Four police officers quickly climbed onto the immobilized tank and opened the hatch with bolt cutters, but Nelson refused to surrender. When he began rocking the tank back and forth to break free of the barrier, one of the officers leaned into the tank and fatally shot him. I believe he was shot like directly in the top part of his heart. It like killed him instantly. Reporters and armchair psychologists were quick to attribute Nelson's rampage to the emasculation of the American male and the demise of the middle class. But Nelson's ex-wife disagreed, telling the San Diego Union Tribune, quote, He just abused drugs. That's it. Well, it's actually, the, I mean, I love this story and I, have, I know a little bit more about it. The whole gold mining operation in his backyard was somewhat of the key to this oh, really? whole tragedy. Yes. Uh, he went to the city uh, a few weeks before this happened and he wanted a permit to mine in his backyard. And the city officials were like, it's your backyard. You don't need any paperwork for that. <laughs> and he's like, no, give me the permit. Give me the paperwork. And they're like, dude, you don't need it. You're good to go. Uh, so he was really mad about the city not giving him the permit for his gold in his backyard, which, by the way, was just jewelry that he had hired uh, a younger like addicts at his house to steal around his neighborhood. He would take the jewelry uh, and put it into his mine in the, the hole in the backyard and then would pay people to bring it out. What? Of the mine. Look, meth uh, was a was a factor in this whole story. Um, yeah. Well, it sounds like, uh, you know, clearly he was emasculated and this is like, uh, the middle class deteriorating. So it just, just an insane story. Uh, the dollop has an episode on this whole story. It's like 90 minutes long. It's so good. It's like one of my favorite episodes of that show. Go check it out. If you want more on that. So they just like read the whole Wikipedia page on it. No, you guys have such a beef against the dollop for some reason. I don't know why. Before it's, you go listen to the dollop, go ahead and follow uh, Pass Gas on whatever uh, stream platform you listen to this. It just makes it easier to listen to. That's right, James. Good good plug. Um, I would love for James to be in this movie. I don't. Oh. You know what, man? I'm not a very good actor. I don't care. Your movie is going to suffer because of nepotism. Would you get method with it? Would you get method? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I'd do a ton of meth. Yeah, sure. I'd do a ton of meth. You know, me. I mean, what's another heart attack? <laughs> Big thanks to Upstart for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. Are you carrying a lot of credit card balance month after month? I know I still have a little bit of that. You're not the only one. High interest rates make it hard to pay off your debt, but Upstart can help. Join the thousands of happy borrowers who helped made that final payment, became debt free. Upstart is a fast and easy way to pay off your debt with a personal loan. Everything is online. Whether it's paying off credit cards, consolidating high interest debt, or funding personal expenses, over half a million people have used Upstart to get a simple fixed monthly payment. Just kind of consolidate everything and make it super easy to pay off your debt. With a five minute online rate check, you can see your rate up front for loans between $1,000 to $50,000. Hopefully you don't have $50,000 worth of debt, but if you do, Upstart has you covered. And you can receive funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. Like a lot of you guys, I had a lot of debt. Sometimes it feels like you're so underwater, you can't pay off debt because you keep getting more overdraft charges and high interest rates just piling on your shoulders. I personally love how easy it is to pay all your bills in one place with Upstart. I feel like that's the first step into becoming debt free. It's also very easy to apply for a loan with them. You get results very quickly. Find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash gas. That's upstart.com slash G-A-S. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Go to upstart.com slash gas. Thank you, Upstart. Big thanks to Valvoline Motor Oil for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. Valvoline was started over 150 years ago when they patented the first motor oil, and they haven't stopped innovating since. 
Some of their innovations include the first high mileage oil, the first synthetic blend, and the first racing oil. But they didn't just stop there, they're, they're constantly reinventing formulas to provide the ultimate protection for every single engine on the road today. In fact, every motor oil that Valvoline makes has recently been reformulated to provide 40% better wear protection than industry standards. Valvoline has been proven to maximize engine life by fighting the four main causes of engine breakdown, which are heat, friction, wear, and deposits. I have a couple high mileage engines in my stable right now, and I only trust Valvoline. Another reason we love Valvoline, they're synonymous with some of the racing greats. I'm talking Mark Martin, Kelly Yarborough, AJ Foyt, and the NASCAR Cup champion Chase Elliott. All those cool dudes. So do yourself a favor and make sure you choose Valvoline. I know I do. Head over to Valvoline.com original to find the right oil for your engine. Thank you, Valvoline. This is the heartwarming tale of Curly Bunfill. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if that last story bummed you out, here's a car heist with a happy ending. Curly Bunfill was a 106-year-old World War II veteran and three-time Purple Heart recipient whose award-winning 1956 Cadillac Eldorado was stolen from his Sacramento garage in early 2020. The car originally belonged to actress Rita Hayworth, one of Hollywood's biggest stars in the 30s and 40s. Huh. After returning from the war, Bunfill had worked as a Hollywood stuntman. <laughs> he recalled befriending Hayworth at a party saying, Our eyes met and we danced, and she had all these cars in her garage. Beautiful, beautiful cars. <laughs> we danced around the cars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> he was either a, a great dancer or dancing around the cars is some kind of uh, weird 50s sex thing uh, because when Hayworth died in 1987 she left him a Bermuda blue Cadillac engraved with her name on the doors trunk and engine compartment that's sick. that's uh, that's hard the theft of the Eldorado quickly made local news and a reward of $7,000 was offered for information. Then, miraculously, the Eldorado was returned to a Sacramento police station without a scratch on it. The man who returned the car told police he had purchased it for $8,600 and didn't know it was stolen until he saw it on TV. His tip eventually led to the arrest of the actual thief. Curly said that when he found out the car had been recovered, I jumped 10 feet in the air. <laughs> <laughs> which unfortunately killed him. Oh, JK, as far as we know, the 106-year-old is still alive and well, presumably still dancing around his Eldorado. <laughs> I hope I can dance when I'm 106. I feel like that's all. I don't know. I don't know how long I'd like to live. 100 years seems like a long time. I think you're, Nolan, you're someone who's going to thrive when they're in their like late 40s, 50s. Oh, I'm looking so forward think... to being like a dad and grandpa. I think that'll be fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have been looking forward to being a grandpa since you were eight. Years it's true. Old. It's true. I think that's just, you know, I I had a, a you know my grandpa Tom was a really cool guy, and uh, oh, like, what do you want your uh, kids and your grandkids to call you? Uh, you know, Grandpa Nolan's probably that's like a mouthful though. Now that I say that out loud, yeah, it's long. What about Papa Nolan? Papa Nolan, that's pretty good. I like that. My my dad would refer to his grandfather as grand or yeah grandpa Sykes and I I like that you know grandpa that Sykes that sounds like you uh, sounds like you're uh, part of a Burger King campaign you got <laughs> sunglasses a backwards hat and a skateboard it's grandpa Sykes <laughs> grandpa Sykes what's up you whippersnappers yeah. out of my way to the half pipe mm. this burger is dead ass delicious <laughs> no cap. <laughs> This burger is bushing. <laughs> and then he does like a rodeo flip. <laughs> These fries are bushing fast. <laughs> no printer. That sounds like a <laughs> like that like plays like once during the Western Conference Finals, and people are like, "What the hell was that?" <laughs> Try the new cheesecake bites. They're gas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. Stealing a Lambo or an 18-wheeler or a tank or a war hero's most prized possession is tricky. But how about stealing 30 cars at once from a recently deceased movie star? That's what Richard Taylor did. 
He was the mechanic for Paul Walker's extensive personal car collection. While Walker was best known for driving souped-up tuner cars in the Fast and Furious franchise, his personal tastes were a bit more eclectic. Among the cars that Taylor oversaw were a 2006 Crown Victoria and a 2004 GMC truck, in addition to five rare 1995 BMW M3s and a 2011 Porsche GT3 RS. Well, less than 24 hours after Walker's death at a charity car show, Taylor moved 30 of those cars out of a storage warehouse, then demanded money from Walker's family in exchange for the location of the boosted vehicles. What a piece of <laughs> shit. In yeah. legal quarters, they call this extortion. Here on Pass Gas, we also call it extortion. <laughs> <laughs> this guy. Yeah. yeah. This guy's a real piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. In revenge for a theft like this, Brian O'Connor and Dom Toretto would probably have dangled Taylor from the back of a speeding dump truck or something. What the Walker family actually did was take Taylor to court. In 2016, a settlement was reached. Although Taylor reportedly had sold several of the vehicles, a lawyer for the Walker family announced that the case, quote, was sub settled amicably, and one of the conditions is that we're getting things back. How, I'm not really sure how you can amicably settle such a dirtbag move, but I guess it helps when your family. That's like yeah. fucked up, dude. That's so fucked up. Yeah, why, like, why would you even negotiate with terrorists like that's like why? not yeah how is that i don't even know man yeah that's a really dirtbag move like they were like friends and then the dude dies and then he steals all this stuff the next day yeah like why like you don't even mourn at all you're just like okay now now's the time to do yeah. this how does he not go to jail no idea the fbi should take him in right yeah but maybe they're too <laughs> This next one's called LOL FBI. Most car thefts are unremarkable. They usually involve someone down on their luck, desperate or not in their right mind. So let's finish by making fun of someone who always deserves it. The feds. Uh oh. <laughs> uh, in 2008, the FBI recovered a stolen 1996 Ferrari F50, which was one of only 349 ever made and worth 750 grand. The car had been lifted from a Pennsylvania dealership five years earlier by a serial bandit named Tom Baker. Baker was an airline pilot who realized he'd never be able to afford all the Ferraris he coveted on his salary, so he stole a bunch of Ferraris. <laughs> this guy sounds okay. cool as shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe not. First, <laughs> first like the next sentence is like, yeah, he was a pedophile. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> First, he convinced a cancer-stricken car salesman in North Carolina that he was a radiologist. Oh, that made the salesman trust him enough to let him take a 1989 Ferrari 328 GTS for a test drive. Neither Baker nor the car ever returned to the dealership. He later pulled a similar trick to jack an 85 Testarossa from a Long Island dealer. Mm. Those were just warm-ups for Baker's greatest theft. Sometime in 2003, Baker appeared at Alger Ferrari in Philadelphia, posing as the CEO of a California tech firm. He claimed he flew into town specifically to buy the dealership's F50 and that he was ready to make a down payment after the mere formality of a test drive. I just, you know, I just got to drive. I got to just drive it. It must have been a convincing story because the dealership handed over the keys. Baker zoomed away at 100 miles per hour over a nearby hill and disappeared. <laughs> the next time anyone saw the car was in 2008. Wow. When FBI agents seized it from a Kentucky emergency room doctor to whom Baker had sold it. Baker was arrested soon after. So why is this a funny story about cops? During Baker's trial, two FBI agents totaled the oh, car. God. Okay. Special Agent Fred Kingston and U.S. Assistant Attorney J. Hamilton Thompson claimed they were transferring the car between storage facilities when bald tires caused them to fishtail off the road and straight into a tree. It's always those bald tires, guys. Bald check tires. your treads. Check your air pressure. Put check. your penny in the treads. If it goes up to Lincoln's beard, you're, you got to <laughs> switch them. I don't, is that how it works? <laughs> yeah. Um. There's always that feeling you get when you're about to do something sketchy in a car. And you're like, should I do this? <laughs> yeah. Uh, trust that feeling. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe you won't f total a Ferrari when you're 
transferring it between storage yeah. facilities. They were totally transferring it, not just taking a super rare supercar on a joyride. I bet storage transfers always need two senior agents present. And yeah. he hasn't <laughs> destroyed $750,000 worth of evidence on the clock. I know not I me. have. Oh, you have? Okay. We'll talk about that off air. Luckily for these agents, the Ferrari itself wasn't needed to convict Baker, but the accident started a whole new array of legal shenanigans. See, back when the car was originally stolen, the Motor Insurance Corporation paid Alger Ferrari $630,000 for the lost merchandise. That transaction gave the insurance company the title to the F50, and they were pretty unhappy when their reappearing Ferrari was immediately totaled by a couple of dillweeds. <laughs> <laughs> the insurance company sued the government for repayment but a judge ruled that the government was not liable for oh damages during the detention of any goods not accepting responsibility for anything nothing new apparently that's true even if that detention includes two government agents pretending to be lightning mcqueen in the end the sad mangled remains of the rare f50 were auctioned off for a paltry 65k what Ooh, and that's how we got the engine for the GT86 um, <laughs> or GT4586. Just kidding. Uh, yeah, that's pretty whack. That's pretty stupid. Yeah. Each thief we've been talking about had different reasons for their heist because any number of things might inspire someone to steal a car. A meth addiction, Ferrari addiction, even a ramen noodle addiction. Unfortunately, though, a story usually ends badly for them and the car. It really sucks how many cars get stolen and chopped up for parts or are simply wrecked in the process. It's a crappy thing to worry about and a sad way for a good vehicle to meet its end. But since it does happen, remember to lock up your babies tighter than the secret recipe for donkey sauce. And if there are any carjackers listening right now, please stay away from my cars. <laughs> uh, uh, none of our cars can get stolen because none of them run. That's fair. That's <laughs> a fair point. Good stuff. Uh, yeah, don't do crimes. Don't steal cars. That's bad. That's the conclusion yeah, it's for your, episode. Like, that's like stealing a house. Yeah, a house that can move. Yeah, for a lot of people, that's the biggest investment they've ever made. And Oh, for sure. You know, it might be like a 97 Civic, and uh, that's their, that actually happened. their livelihood. That happened. When we were shooting uh, a wheelhouse a couple years ago, 10 best cars under $10,000. Uh, one that. of the cars was an e EG Civic hatch, and two hours after they left the shoot uh the car was stolen and then we like put out like put out a bunch of uh posts about it and the car was returned i think within 12 hours whoa um no yeah. questions asked or what i don't remember uh no we shot the guy yeah we went out and did some vigilant street, street justice. justice yeah steal hearts don't steal cars it, nolan you're 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 writing this san diego tank movie yeah. Uh, James is the lead. Yeah. Who, even though he says are, he can't act. Who's the night night security person that you know is is a blunder blunder boy? I think boy. that's my role. Since you're asking, no, you're too smart for that. Yeah, but he's I, a great actor, so he can pretend to be dumb. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, I don't need to pretend. Well, who's the wife that, or who's the girlfriend? Hmm. The ex-wife, um, Lizzie Kaplan. Ooh. Ooh okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Who are who are like the four cops that go up to the tank? Uh, Seth Rogen. I was just about to say <laughs> Seth Rogen, <laughs> but like in a more serious role. <laughs> well, how's he laugh? <laughs> no, this is like Seth Rogen in his like transition drama role. Yeah. Like this yeah. is this is his uh this is his uh, rare uh uh uncut gems yeah. moment yeah. here. Jeremy well, Renner is the one who pulls the trigger. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he kills me. I'm gonna and I'm gonna lose like seventy five pounds to play this. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna and we'll also put makeup on you so you look even more gaunt. Yeah. Um and then like uh we gotta like hire some younger actors to play like the, the meth heads that go and steal the jewelry around the <laughs> yeah, neighborhood. Like Timothy Chalamet, uh yeah. oh perfect Sp Spider Man. <laughs> yeah. And uh Wait, those are handsome meth heads. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, they're yeah. really good looking. It's San Diego. <laughs> yeah, it's San Diego, dude. And then one of the cops is also Danny Franco. Who's Danny Franco? Dave or Davey Franco. Dave Franco. Yeah, Dave <laughs> Franco. I want 
a stunt cast Taylor Lautner in there for some reason. I don't mm. know where we have. Maybe he's the security guard at the gate. Yeah, I think yeah. that maybe we're think, spending so much money on this cast. <laughs> I think that yeah, maybe, I think we maybe we switch out Timothy Chalamet for like Clark Duke or something. <laughs> Clark Duke. Oh, act, you know what? Maybe we cast the members of Brockhampton. Oh yeah, it's <laughs> all break of it them. up. Cool. Anyway, we've cast the movie. Thank you for so much for listening to this episode. Uh, sorry about the audio quality. Stuff happens, man. That's just how how it goes. Follow the show if you haven't yet. Follow, follow, follow us on your preferred podcast platform of choice, whether it be Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, whatever, what have you. Follow us. That really helps us out. And guess what? It's free. It'll always be free. Our voices will always be free. We were born free. We will live free we will live forever. Free. Thank you so much for listening to Pass Gas. <laughs> Follow all the boys at their social medias. Follow James at James Pumphrey. Follow Joe at Joe G. Weber. Check out his Twitch stream, by the way. Uh, follow me at Nolan J. Sykes. I'll, I'll see you out there. <laughs> see you outside. See you outside, everyone. <laughs>